Hey, this is the Fight Nerd. I'm here at Progressive Martial Arts today. And just so happened to catch Mr. Eric Paulson, who is the head coach at CSW. Eric, thanks for being here today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Now, of course, i got to ask you first thing first. You know, we all are looking forward to Josh Barnett, Fedor Emelianenko, Affliction Trilogy. Unfortunately, the fight didn't happen. We haven't heard from Josh in a while. Um, how's he been doing since this happened? Oh, he's great. He's still been training like he was before. Uh, he's just not sparring with a bunch of guys. He's sparring all the time. He's conditioning. He's lifting. He's staying in great shape. Uh, right now, basically, he's getting ready. He's got a pro wrestling match coming up in Japan. He had a match set up in Sengoku in November, and their fight got pushed, I believe, till probably January now. Is there going to be an opportunity for Barnett to take on Fedor at a later time, I think, maybe in Japan? Gosh, I wish, I hope to God that that would happen. Um, you know, we, we've, I've helped him prepare for, for all of his fights for the last seven years, and you know, this last fight falling through like that it was a big heartache for me and for him, obviously. But uh, I would like, I mean, I think, the, I think the public would like to see that fight happen. Uh, we just have to find an organization that would actually have that fight happen. Okay, now on to something else. You yourself are a practitioner of many different martial arts styles. Can you just run those off real fast? Cause there's so many. I've, I've already lost track. Uh, well, boxing. Um, I've been boxing for a long time with all these different uh, boxing coaches. Uh, thai boxing mixed with Savat, so we call it STX. Savat Thai cross training. Uh, also, uh, judo. I train with uh, the judo guys for a long time in um, Europe and in America. And um, uh, I was able to go to Japan and actually study sambo with some of the, the guys that were doing it. But the sambo was... It was just pretty much judo and, and the leg locks from Shuto. So uh, when I trained in Shuto, Yuri Nakamura had basically so many submissions, I couldn't see straight. So I was with Yuri for, I don't know, 12 years, Yuri Nakamura. He founded Shuto in America. And I, at the same time, I was training with the Gracies and with the Machados. So uh, uh, I, I had been training with Dan and Asano for years, Silat, Wing Chun, Savat, Filipino Kali, um, uh, Mafalindo Silat, Malaysian, Filipino, Indonesian. And uh, basically what I did is I tried to just boil it down to a few things that, that were useful for, for fighting. Or striking takedown submission, boxing, strong boxing, good takedowns, wrestling, and submission is mixed, catch wrestling and jiu-jitsu. So where did this thirst for knowledge come from you? I want to study all these different martial arts. Um, I was intrigued as a little kid. I, I started watching uh, Bruce Lee movies, and I don't know. Once I started doing it, I was like, "Wow, this is this is meant to be." And so I just kind of was like so intrigued by all the different martial arts, and um, uh, not so much the art form so much anymore, as opposed to the stuff that I can actually apply in the arena. Now you mentioned you do practice Kali, which is a knife fighting style from the Philippines. And one of the principles behind that is that you learn to defend from a weapon first, and then you learn how to do hand-to-hand, -hand, whereas a lot of other styles are hand-to-hand -hand first, then weapons. Now, what do you think about that transition? Does that work best for you, or why do you think that is in the first place? Uh, Kali, the, the, uh, stick, the stick goes 100 miles an hour, and so it trains your eye faster. So when you're following a stick and a knife around, your ability to pick things up are a lot faster, and the, the angles of attack are very similar to the angles of attack for striking. In fact, Panatukin, which is the Filipino boxing, derived from the Filipino knife fighting. The same movements for the boxing was used for the knife fighting. So do you think that having a traditional martial arts background helps you, or do you need it to do mixed martial arts? I think it's good if you're going to promote martial arts, if you're going to promote the fighting. A lot of guys go, oh, I'm just a fighter. It's like, well, what's your history? Do you have a history background? Uh, what's a Bushido code? The Bushido code has been lost a lot in fighting because guys just talk smack, they just get tattoos, they just train hard. and You know, that's great for publicity, for TV, and for show, but in the end, what, do you, what are you passing on? To, what's, what, what are you passing on to the youth? What are you passing on to all the other people out there? What's the message that you're bringing on? Uh, it, you have to, to, to pass it on, you have to have information, not just being tough, not just being a good fighter, but you have to have an art behind you that you're teaching and passing on, otherwise it just gets completely lost. The respect factor, the discipline, the discipline is showing up on time and being at the gym when you say, being accountable for what you say. The moral code is the way you conduct yourself outside of the gym, 
And I think that all needs to be uh, a lot of emphasis needs to be placed on that, especially for coaches and their fighters. You know, don't talk. Be the one talked about. That's the biggest goal. Don't talk. Be the one talked about. So do you think that moral code is what's missing from some fighters today? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And uh, and who is to blame? Their coaches. Their coaches are to blame. Hey, you're a good fighter. You're tough. And these guys just get on the Internet and blab and just talk and talk and talk. But it's like, okay. And they don't respect elders at all. They don't respect guys that were in the game before. Uh, oh, I can only, well, I can beat them up, so therefore I don't have to learn from them. Hey, did Mike Tyson, could he beat up his boxing coach? 100%. Yeah. But guess what? That guy made him a better boxer. And he taught him a lot about life. You know, who's your idol? I want to be like this guy. Yeah, well, you're a role model. If you're a role model, you better act like a role model and, you know, don't flip off the crowd. Don't uh, swear in front of everybody. Don't do not do bad things. Don't get in trouble and, and then laugh about it. You know, be ashamed. If you get in trouble, be ashamed and show the public that you're ashamed. I'm sorry and apologize. That's what I think. Now you've also been doing a lot of work with Brock Lesnar preparing for some fights, is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. And what do you think about at his last outing where he kind of did some of those uh, some rude gestures to the crowd and some really out-of-character things at the post-fight press conference? What's your take on that situation? My take on that situation, number one, is that before the fight, Brock never said a word about Frank. Frank was the one talking about Brock and insulting his coaches, which was one of them was me, and his camp, and just talked bad on Brock. And he's like, hey, Brock goes, I don't know. Frank, so I'm not going to say a word, but I'm going to let my hands do my talking, and afterwards I'm going to open my mouth. When Brock won, Frank was pretty much out cold, delirious, and Brock had turned his back, and as he was turning around, Frank stood up in his face, and Brock just turned around and went, what the heck? And all of a sudden, Brock kind of shoved him a little bit because it was just a surprise. He was just right there. First of all, they didn't allow any of the coaches, which one of them was me, in the ring after the fight. So by not allowing me in the ring, in the cage, or Marty in the ring, or Greg in the ring, we couldn't put our hands on Brock and go, you know, congratulations. You know, hey, shh, don't, do, don't say that, don't do that. And since day one, Brock has been booed from everybody. Everybody has booed Brock. So he goes, well, I guess if I'm going to be the heel, I might as well play the heel. So as soon as he turned around, Frank was in his face. He shoved him. He goes, hey. You know, I already beat you up. You know, it's time to keep your mouth shut. And then all of a sudden, everyone goes, boo. And he goes, boo. And well, then boo this. Bink. And he gave him the double finger. And was I laughing? I was like, jeez. You know, if we were in there, we could have stopped it. And then he went off with the showmanship stuff about, you know, saying about Coors Light. Uh, instead of Bud Light, because Bud Light won't pay him. And then he's going to jump on his wife later. Uh, some of that's funny. Some of it was like the sponsorship thing was completely unprofessional. And it, the, the flipping the crowd off was, it, was just, it was a response to everyone booing him because he's been booed since, even at the weigh-ins when he walks out. He didn't get cheered. He got booed. He's always been booed. I've been in his corner since day one. He's been booed. So he's just like, okay, I'm booed. Guess what? I'm the enemy. Here's the enemy. So you'll either pay to watch him fight or pay to watch him get his butt kicked, but you'll still pay to watch him. And so, uh, yeah, let us in the cage next time, and he won't do that. You know, and he, I think he's smart enough now, after that one time, that he's, he's not going to do that again. Now, the last time we saw you fight, it's actually almost been the two-year anniversary of uh, the first HD net fight. You came out of retirement, you won your fight. It's been two years since then. Are we going to see Eric Paulson back in the ring one more time? Um, uh, maybe, maybe not. Chances are maybe not, just because uh, after that fight I was prepared. I prepared hard for four months for that fight just to, to, to cut weight and to uh, get ready. And, and then I tried to roll over to four fights after that, and they all fell through. And I forgot that one of the biggest heartaches for me when I was fighting, more than anything, was being ready for a fight and having fights offered and then falling through after. And it's like, you know what? When you don't have a lot of time left in your fight career and you're coming out of retirement to do a fight, you need to fight. And um, when, when your fights just keep falling through, it's like, I have a real job. I have other things that I do uh, than just just fight. And, you know, I've been putting all my effort into my fighters, not into myself, and and also into my students when I do seminars and, and train other fighters in other camps. Uh, I would probably get a lot more out of that than just training myself to get for, ready for another fight. So if you had a serious, concrete offer from a legit promoter, would you come back in with that? Sure, of course I would, but I haven't had something like that. 
uh, and I thought I did, and then it all fell through. So, uh, yeah. So in the meantime, I'll just train and get everyone else better and uh, be happy doing that. All right, well, Eric Paulson, thanks for your time. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. This video is sponsored by FindMMAGym.com. Looking for a new place to train? Head over to the best online directory for MMA gyms across the U.S. FindMMAGym.com.